Hello and welcome. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace, fill full the mouth of famine, and bid the sickness cease. These lines from a poem by British writer Rudyard Kipling date back to 1899 and reflect the Western world's attitude back then towards the poor of developing nations. It was not all that long ago that some schools in the West used to raise aid money by asking children for pennies for black babies or something similar. Well, in recent years, aid to places like Africa has gone through an evolution with something of a battle between those who believe it's all about giving money and those who think that that does more harm than good. It's a cause that has attracted Hollywood and music industry celebrities such as Bono or Bob Geldof calling for debt relief for Africa. So have the hundreds of billions of dollars of Western aid to Africa helped or hurt? The foreign ministers of the G8 have just been meeting in Germany in advance of next week's G8 summit with yet more promises of aid for Africa. One prominent American economist has argued for years that the West has failed and continues to fail in its aid plans for the poorest of the poor. Professor William Easterly teaches economics at the New York University and is co-director of the university's Development Research Institute. He spent 16 years as a research economist at the World Bank. His latest book, The White Man's Burden, takes its title from that Rudyard Kipling poem I quoted you. Professor Eastley joins us today to explain why, as he puts it, the West's effort to aid the rest have done so much ill and so little good. Professor, it's good to have you with us. Nice to be here. Sir, obviously that first question has to be taking into consideration the title of your book, Why So Much Ill and So Little Good? Well, there's really two big factors. One is that aid money often props up corrupt dictators, makes them stay longer in power, makes the governments of poor countries more accountable to the aid donors than they are to their own people. And second, just throwing money at the problem really hides the whole question of whether the aid is really reaching the poor. There's so much focus on just the amount of money spent that nobody is asking, is this aid money actually reaching the poorest of the poor? But isn't that more a situation that occurred uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago? Haven't people started to ask the right questions and hasn't there been a, a lot more accountability in where the money goes and what's done with it? Uh, the aid agencies are always claim that they are new, new and improved versions of their old selves. Uh, that's, that's their answer to every criticism. Yes, that was true back then, but now we're better. Unfortunately, none of the, the indicators, either anecdotal or in the statistics that I study, show any signs of improvement. Well, give, us a, I mean, give us the reason you chose that title, The White Man's Burden, for your book. Well, I see a continuity between the, the old sort of racist attitude towards the rest of the world and what is now no longer so explicitly racist but still very paternalistic attitude towards the West. Uh, people like Bono and Tony Blair, they say things like, it's up to us to save Africa. And I, I find that incredibly patronizing and rather insulting, frankly, to Africans. Uh, Africans can solve their own problems just like the rest of us. Now, you do suggest that you know, there, is, uh, you know, there exists this sense of moral duty, I guess, uh, to, to help the poor, whether they need help or not. So, I mean, does that imply they don't want the help? Well, uh, uh, of course they would like the help if it was provided in, a, in an effective way and that left them lots of autonomy to, to choose what they want. Unfortunately, both of those conditions are violated. Aid is put kind of forced down the, the throat of the poor countries with lots of conditions attached, which often destroy the effectiveness of the aid. And the poor have very little voice, very little ability to give any feedback on whether they're getting what they want or not. They're completely powerless. So how do you think, uh, Professor, how do you think the uh, aid programs for places like Africa and developing nations have evolved over, say, say the past quarter of a century? Uh, well, they've gotten a lot better at public relations. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the positive. Uh, that, that's what gives the impression of positive progress. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, you know, the hard facts don't support the idea of progress. Uh, Africa continues to be the, the poorest region in the world, even though it's the most an aid-intensive region in the world. It's had the worst economic growth. It's basically had zero rise in living standards since independence, despite $568 billion in aid going to Africa over, the, over that time period. Now, I know uh, there's been criticism often that uh, developed nations are being forced to westernize when they'd rather look to modernize. To what extent do you think that's true? Yeah, I think there's something to that. I think. Um, the, the, more, the, the real general issue is the idea that West, the West is forcing the poor countries to change in ways that the West thinks are best. And that's really a, a, a destructive approach because it either, it either has no effect, which is of course useless, 
or if it does have an effect, then there's a lot tremendous resentment t towards the West because outsiders are forcing you to change. Nobody likes that. I mean, would uh, would Americans like it if uh, you know Canada told us how to run our our government or our, our fiscal policy? <laughs> you know, of course not. And uh, people in poor countries are just the same. Well, Professor, you know, of course, in um, the G8 is going to meet next week, and uh, they made an ambitious plan in 2005 at the Glen Eagles uh, Summit to provide a comprehensive aid package for Africa and, and the developing world. Let's have a look at some of the things that they've they've suggested. For example, you know, doubling of aid by 2010. Uh, that's an extra $50 billion worldwide and 25 of that uh, for Africa. Writing off debts uh, of 18 of the world's poorest countries, a commitment to end all export subsidies, uh, World uh, WTO set a 2030 deadline, uh, more accountable governments, universal access to HIV AIDS treatment by 2010, funding treatment to well, the bed nets, a big issue, fight malaria, saving the lives of you know, 600,000 children every year, full funding to eradicate polio, 2015 all children to have good um, education and health care uh, where possible. Those, I mean, those all sound very good and sound like worthy goals. Surely there should be some uh, support for that kind of idea. Well, there's most of the attention has been attracted by this pledge to double aid. And doubling of aid has this great symbolic role. Whenever, whenever anyone starts to worry about the problems of poor people, any time in the last 50 years, they have always called du for du exactly doubling of foreign aid. I've actually documented this in about you know f 10 different aid documents going back n into the 1950s. So it, it seems to be like a token. But of course, you know this is just the this by itself does not necessarily accomplish anything. These are the costs of helping poor people. These are not the benefits that you bring to poor people. Uh, stressing the aid money spent and doubling the aid money spent. This would be like you know General Motors saying. Oh, we're going to double our costs. Isn't that great? You know, don't the shareholders love us? Well, that would be ridiculous for a private firm, and it's actually equally ridiculous for the aid industry. Well, let's let's see. I mean, I, I've spoken uh, over over the last uh, couple of years to a number of key players, but talking about issues such as uh, aid and development and so on. One of them was uh, obviously a very prominent uh, uh, character in all this, Bob Geldof, and this is what he had to say when it came to well, as he describes a eureka moment. They think there's a eureka moment. Well, you didn't make poverty history. Of course not. It's a strap line. But we did begin. And it's a difference in 20 years. We could only deal with the symptoms 20 years ago. We truly began to deal with the structures of poverty this year, last year. And dealing with the structure of poverty, you feel that's not the case? Well, first of all, I'm really struck by how Bob Geldof uses this word, we. You know, we are starting to help them. <laughs> it's, it's, again, it seems to be the the white man's burden in action, or maybe the, the white band's burden in the case of the rock stars. Uh, and no, I don't see any evidence that, that this money is dealing with the structures of poverty. It's not creating economic growth. Like I, I said before, there's been uh, zero economic growth in Africa. In terms of uh, having celebrities involved, though, Bono and, and Bob Geldof, of course they did raise public awareness. Surely there's some good com coming out of that, though. I, I will grant that there's some good coming out of that, that there's more public awareness. Uh, unfortunately, they, the way they channel that awareness is into really simplistic ideas like doubling foreign aid. I know some of your ideas go to head to head with some of your, uh, you know, your peers. Um, one of them, of course, being someone who's made a, a big name for himself uh, in the public eye, and that's uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. And here's something he said uh, when, I, when I interviewed him about the issue of poverty and, and some some action. Mm -hmm. We're uniquely the first generation on the planet that could see to the end of extreme poverty if we choose to do so. It's amazing. That, that's a bold statement, that we could see the end of poverty. I know you I'm tend sorry. to think of that as very utopian, don't you? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, he's kind of one-upping Bob, Bob Geldof on the white man's burden. He's not only, uh, you know, saying we can save the rest of the world, but he's offering this kind of utopian vision. Of, in, in his book, he actually lists the, the trinity of prosperity for all, the end, the end of poverty, prosperity, peace, democracy, that all of this, you know, we will achieve and presumably obtain the, the lion lying down with the lamb and who knows what else. Well, of course, you, your critics would say, well, what would you suggest then? At least he's being positive. Well, it doesn't help to be positive if you promise things that can never be realized and for which no one will be held accountable for realizing. Uh, what I, the kind of things I like to propose are, are concrete things that somebody could take responsibility for doing like getting malaria bed nets to people at risk of malaria, take responsibility for whether the bed nets actually arrive or not, whether they are used, whether they're successful in preventing malaria. That's the kind of specific do thing that I would Do you I, feel I that's not emphasize. being done? Because I know you're, you're against it's the top-down right. approach, aren't you? 
Yeah, it's not being done because uh, although there's uh, plenty of programs to provide bed nets, it's done in a very top-down kind of way, as you said, by people who are really kind of like s almost like Soviet central planners in their mentality. You know that we decide how much how many bed nets uh, Tanzania needs, and then we ship them off, and then you just magically expect them to to work to prevent malaria. Actually, it takes a lot of bottom-up feedback to get the program to work, because you need to find a way to work with local people so that local people actually use the bed nets and, and actually be protected from mosquitoes rather at, than at night rather, th rather than yeah. uh, having the nets diverted to the black market or just sit around in their package unopened as has happened many times. Professor, I'll ask you to address an email that we got from Rene Pullman in the Netherlands. It was one of the emails we got when we said you were coming on. And, and Rene Pullman says, to some extent you cannot guarantee or control the development because local authorities have so much to say in the actual situation. I'm presuming you agree with that. I totally agree with that. I think in the end aid could do a, a little bit of good by providing something like a mosquito net. But aid by outsiders cannot achieve development. Only homegrown development is the only kind that works. Only the, the people themselves can, can climb their own way out of poverty. That's the way poverty has always ended, and it's the way it will always end in the future. How, how do you avoid duplication? I mean, if people are, are saying, we desperately need these, you know, we need bed nets, for example, we need these medicines, how can you avoid that voice going out to so many different agencies that there is duplication and, again, a lack of coordination? Surely there has to be some kind of person at the top or people at the top helping to coordinate? Oh, well, there have been uh, thousands of attempts to coordinate <laughs> by people at the top, which have all proven in a completely ineffective because basically for the same reason that Soviet central planning didn't succeed in coordinating all, all uh, the consumer demands that had to be met by the Soviet economy. It's just impossible. It's impossible to control such an unwieldy bureaucratic apparatus. So you shouldn't rely so much on bureaucracy to solve the problems of poor people. So, so give me a, a path uh, that you would c consider appropriate. Say, for example, there's, there's a pool of money, for example, in the United States, there's a need for it in, in say, a part of uh, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. How would you pr propose a line uh, of getting what's there to those who need it? Yeah, well, I think what we need to do in, in aid is really shift the mindset away from this kind of central planning bureaucracy mindset to think of the role of uh, private entrepreneurs in market economies. You know, they find ways to find new and creative things, new and creative ways to meet the needs of consumers. But aren't they the ones so who might sell the bed nets? That's the uh, problem. They, they, could they could sell the bed nets. That, that would be fine. You know, that would work a lot better than the aid bureaucracy. Uh, sorry, I meant on the black market. <laughs> I mean, they, aren't they the entrepreneurs? Uh, well, we can, you know, change their reward system so that <laughs> they sell them to the people who are going to get okay. malaria. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that all efforts have to make a profit. There is such a thing as social entrepreneurs that find new and creative ways to meet the needs of poor people. You know, the great example of which recently is Mohammed Yunus winning the Nobel Peace Prize for his great microcredit schemes that uh, make it possible for poor widows to lift themselves out of poverty with small loans from his Grameen Bank. Right. You know, these are the kind of entrepreneurs that we need in aid. We need a lot less bureaucrats, a lot more entrepreneurs kind of searching for solutions that work consulting from the bottom up to get feedback. How, how many people do you find in, in, you know, in your business or, in you, sorry, in your um, uh, line of expertise, do you find agreeing with your point of view? Because obviously the, the, the publicity goes to those who say more money, big development, you know, the Jeffrey Sachs and the, the Bob Geldofs, they're the ones who are making the headlines. Uh, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer neutrally <laughs> since, uh, or in the sense that <laughs> I mean, do, I'm do biased, feel, but uh, do you feel that you have uh, a fair amount uh, of support for your ideas, or are uh, you battling? Yeah. Are you battling yeah. upstream? Uh, no, I feel like there's a lot of support in the in the economics profession that I talked, and the whole development practitioners profession that uh, you know the people that I interact with. There's a lot of support for these ideas. Uh, I, I find a lot of good give and take with development practitioners and other economists. And, and frankly, there's almost, uh, you know, very little, almost, you know, very little support for, uh, for the kind of simplistic approach that Professor Sachs takes. What do you expect to come out of uh, the G8 summit uh, next week then? What would you hope would, would be more in line with what you'd like to see? I'd really like to see, you know, accountability get serious. Uh, you know, there, accountability is a word that people already use because, you know, bureaucracies are very ingenious in capturing whatever whatever word you might use to criticize them, but people don't really understand what accountability means. It means, you know, 
individual responsibility to achieve a given task. And if you don't achieve it, there's some consequences for you. You know, you're rewarded if you do achieve So if you get bed nets to successfully prevent malaria in a given area of Tanzania, you're rewarded. And if you don't, you're, pun you're penalized. Now that's true accountability, and that's been completely missing in aid. That's one of the many reasons aid has not worked well. So just a very quick thought, 20 seconds to go. Uh, change at the World Bank, you were there 16 years as economist uh, and research economist. Wolfowitz out, Zolikin, what, what do you think will change? Uh, Zolik doesn't have much of a track record in development, so it's hard to say, but I hope they move away from this utopian vision that seems to be so popular these days. Well, Professor William Insley, thank you very much for joining us, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. On the next show, we speak with one of the most prominent anti-war movement uh, leaders, Cindy Sheehan, who announced this week that she was resigning from the movement temporarily to figure out her next step. Don't forget, if you have any thoughts about pressing issues around the world, send your emails to riz at aljazeera.net. We'll see you next time. Street Talk's coming up next.